There are skies that I haven't been able to forget. One hovering beside me on an evening train journey from Warsaw to Łódź, Mazowsza's western edge raising itself upward to bloody its fields in the last light. The blank orange without gradient spread out above the train tracks at Warszawa Strasse in Berlin, which set the rails to glowing, made molten as if in some smithy of the soul, or the dusk in New Delhi in which the pale white upper reaches of the sky sank into crimson and the bats began to wheel in the viscous evening air. When reading a literary text, I can find myself most fulfilled at those moments of stillness, those passages during which language stands foremost, divested of its duty towards the mechanics of deed or the arc of a story. Those moments when one is forced to look at the world anew, when one has the impression of acquiring a new language through which to describe it, as a painter mixes new colors to conjure an object's contours on a blank canvas. This quality I'm speaking of is nowhere more apparent, it seems to me, than in descriptions of the sky. Such descriptions may at times have far more impact due to their coexistence with characters and deeds, and may even serve an auxiliary purpose designed to foreground precisely these aspects of the text. It's my experience, however, that many writers whom I admire often use the sky as a carrier of meaning, as a reflecting glass to send back in varicolored brilliance the weight and complexity of a given moment. I thought I would collect here a number of such moments in which the sky is saturated with significance. And I'd also encourage you to add your own in the comments so that we might together create a kind of literary sky collage of our own. No one writes about the sky like Cormac McCarthy, and he does so nowhere more powerfully than in Blood Meridian. In fact, the sky is so prevalent that it's even evoked in the book's subtitle, The Evening Redness in the West. For all the weight of sunset as a symbol in Blood Meridian, I was perhaps most captivated by one of his sunrises. They rode on and the sun in the east flushed pale streaks of light and then a deeper run of color, like blood seeping up in sudden reaches, flaring plane-wise. And where the earth drained up into the sky at the edge of creation, the top of the sun rose out of nothing, like the head of a great red phallus, until it cleared the unseen rim and sat squat and pulsing and malevolent behind them. For me, this passage marries beauty and violence with a perfected intensity. Creation and destruction the twin impulses of humankind, or perhaps in this specific instance, mankind, hang together in this sky with all the obvious tangibility of a fact. The sun as malevolent phallus is the propagator of that blood-drenched seed, ensuring humanity's continued desolation of its environment and of itself. And yet the sun's corona, its pale, glowing halo that streaks the sky is simultaneously glorious and beautiful to look upon. It would be easy to see this sky as the mirroring of the character's vile acts of brutality alone, but its aesthetic brilliance also encourages that glimpse of tenderness which is to be found only fleetingly between Blood Meridian's covers, so concerned as it is with endings rather than beginnings. While on the subject of endings and beginnings, Philip Larkin's Obad closes with a particularly punishing image. The title Obad usually refers to a song of the morning or involves the parting of lovers at dawn. Larkin distorts this form, twisting it into a bleak and listless catalogue of the speaker's thoughts upon waking, a meditation on mortality. Slowly, light strengthens, and the room takes shape. It 
It stands plain as a wardrobe. What we know, have always known, know that we can't escape, yet can't accept. One side will have to go. Meanwhile, telephones crouch, getting ready to ring in locked-up offices, and all the uncaring, intricate, rented world begins to rouse. The sky is white as clay with no sun. Work has to be done. Postmen, like doctors, go from house to house. For me, it is the multitude of conflicting possibilities in the image of a sky as white as clay that makes this poem so effective. It is the coalescence of potentiality and finitude that hurts so much. The word clay is allowed to carry a lot. It is at once unfired clay, the malleable matter of a human life that might still be molded given its ideal shape under the sculptor's hand. Its whiteness, however, suggests to us that the firing is done, all its potential ossified into a moribund, etiolated form. It is at once the clay of creation and of the grave, which, the poet reminds us, none escape. Georg Büchner's short prose fragment, Lenz, explores the breakdown of a mind succumbing to destructive mental illness. Lenz, the main character, has been described as a paranoid schizophrenic, a condition in which Büchner was professionally interested as a physician. We meet Lenz wandering through the mountains and very soon encounter a rather perplexing image. Den 20. ging Lenz durchs Gebirg. Die Gipfel und hohen Bergflächen im Schnee. Die Täler hinunter graues Gestein, grüne Flächen, Felsen und Tannen. Es war nass kalt. Das Wasser rieselte die Felsen hinunter und sprang über den Weg. Die Äste der Tannen hingen schwer herab in die feuchte Luft. Am Himmel zogen graue Wolken, aber alles so dicht, und dann dampfte der Nebel herauf und strich schwer und feucht durch das Gesträuch, so träg, so plump. Er ging gleichgültig weiter. Es lag ihm nichts am Weg, bald auf, bald abwärts. Müdigkeit spürte er keine. Nur war es ihm manchmal unangenehm, dass er nicht auf dem Kopf gehen konnte. Upon first reading the book, I recall being very confused by Lenz's peculiar desire to walk on his head. It would take a poet to make some sense of it for me. On the 22nd of October in 1960, the great poet Paul Zalan gave an address in Darmstadt after being awarded the Georg Büchner Prize. Zalan describes this moment in the text as the place where we are able to locate the strangeness, the place where Lenz was able to set himself free as an estranged eye. Tzalan goes on, a man who walks on his head, ladies and gentlemen, a man who walks on his head sees the sky below as an abyss, the sky as a wide yawning expanse into which one at any moment might plummet is also a reflecting glass that lays bare a tortured temperament. This has always struck me as one of those truths that can only be arrived at by a writer, akin to Nabokov's assertion that the great tragedy of Gregor Zamza's transformation is the fact that he never found out that he had wings under the hard covering of his back. The sky might also function as the concentrated essence of a moment of change or horror, as in Michael Weehunt's story, The Devil Under Maison Blue, in which our young protagonist, Gillian, is forced to recall being abused by her father when looking at the sky. She remembers she's always thinking of the back seat of her father's convertible. After a sudden detour, 
into a clump of maples, her mouth still sticky from ice cream. Her father whispered those words and then sneaked a kiss along her neck as she peered up between the full trees into blind blue and clouds like stuffing pulled out of dolls. As a child, who among us didn't look up at the clouds and try to find familiar shapes in their arcane formations? This one resembling a dog gaping more, that one very like a whale. It is an exercise in innocent imagination, so natural in any child, to find an echo of the game here, though with its innocent heart ripped out, to see it reflecting the moment when innocence is prematurely lost, crystallized in the image of mutilated toys, strikes me as a uniquely powerful distillation of an almost unimaginable pain. In Tony Harrison's long political poem, V, it's a personal moment that stands out most vividly to me. As the poet leaves his parents' graves and the city of Leeds where they're buried, he reflects upon his feelings of separation and distance from the place where he was born and educated. The grounds carpeted with petals as I throw the aerosol, the harp can, the cleared weeds on top of dad's dead daffodils, then go with not one glance behind away from Leeds. The bus to the station, still the number one, but goes by routes that I don't recognize. I look out for known landmarks as the sun reddens the swabs of cloud in darkening skies. Home, home, home to my woman as the red darkens from a fresh blood to a dried. Here, the metaphor seems to be the sun and sky as wound, a wound opened by proximity to Leeds, which splits and bleeds as though perhaps the poet has worried an old scar that had closed upon his leaving as a young man for better, brighter things. A peculiarly powerful image for anyone who lives away from where they grew up. Returning often brings pain along with comfort. Twinned in this sunset are two striking images. The darkening sky is both the decaying orbit around this wound sun brought about by the leave-taking and the coagulating blood, a scab forming around the reopened wound. It is perhaps one of life's great pleasures to be able to look at the sky, which, though it may be obscured by tower blocks and skyscrapers, or glimpsed in narrow, splintered fragments of light is always there and each day performs an altered performance. When one has the chance to meet its gaze directly and look upon it in its full blossoming combustion or at the embers of its last conflagration, one is reminded of this fact most profoundly that no two days are exactly alike, however much it may feel that they are. And this daily performance, perhaps, is what language and poetry might teach us when they soar to the vault of the heavens to make use of that larger canvas. That a new formulation can mean a new thought and a new, perhaps inexhaustibly new, way of seeing. Let me know in the comments if you've encountered moments when the sky functions as a profound conductor of meaning. I'd love to see what you have to share with me. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really means a lot to me. Thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you next time.